Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together in your name. We thank you, God, that you've protected us, that you've kept us today to start off our week, our work weeks. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would go ahead of us. You said that you do. You go before us and you prepare a way this week. So, Father God, I pray that our eyes would be open, that we would see your way this week, that we would see your way through possibly how to interact with one another, with those around us and those that we uh, work with, Father God, and, and those in our families. Lord, I pray that we would see your way and how to speak to one another, Amen. Lord, and how to shine our lights for you, Father. I pray that our ears would be open, Father, to hear your voice say, this is the way, walk in it. I pray that we would hear your voice say, Lord, uh, Lord, that you would uh, give us words to say to speak to someone. Give us words of knowledge for your children, for your daughters, and for your sons that need to hear a word from you, that need encouragement, Father. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would open our minds and you would open our understanding, Holy Spirit, to teach us the words that you inspired in this holy word. I pray, Lord God, that our hearts would be tilled and that the seed would go deep into our spirits and that it would bring fruit and fruit that would remain, Father. We give you all praise and all glory for this time, Father. This is now your time. You use my mouth to speak your words and your truth, Father. I am just your servant, Lord. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the manna that we're about to receive, Father. We receive it with glad hearts. And Lord, we know that you don't disappoint. We know that when we eat this manna, we'll never hunger again and we'll never thirst again. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 I believe last time we left off right okay that kind of startled me <laughs> that must have been the bus out there <laughs> wow someone was excited to get going at the red we light the interview the interview that's what i thought we were getting ready to go to the door correct isn't it the candlestick no the we still have the door at the at the bottom the intervale and then at the very bottom of page 10 in our outlines we have the door oh okay no Okay. Scratch what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's what I. That's where I thought we were. So that's what I, where I have <laughs> my notes going to. All right. So let's talk. We do have a lot that we're going to be reading from the outline and a lot of things. Again, please don't uh, don't let anything stop you from asking any questions or if the Lord or the Holy Spirit shows something to you, please feel free to speak up. We want to hear from one another. It just enriches uh, what God is trying to teach us tonight. So we're on page 10, we're at the door. And what this door that we're talking about is we had already talked about the gate, right? The, out, the outer gate that you would come into the inner court where you would see the brazen altar, you would see the laver. And now we're actually going into the tabernacle. Okay, we're out, we're, we're actually going in. We talked about those different uh, elements. We talked about the actual, uh, all the different skins and the layers that were on the top. Remember, we talked about the wood being overlaid with gold on the inside. Uh, we talked about uh, the different pieces. We didn't go into detail on them, which we will tonight, about the table of showbread, the candelabra, or the candlestick, and the altar of incense that were in there. And then we had that inner veil, which we know that that was what was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross, okay? The door is between the outer court and now coming into the holy place. This is the door that we're talking about. Okay? Not the holy of holies. Exactly. Yes. So you have the outer, you have the, all that gate. You have that, remember, you have to go through that one gate to come in. The brazen altar, you have the laver. Then you have the door that we're talking about now to go into the holy place. And that's where, remember, it was two-thirds of the, the size of that part of the building, two-thirds of it. And you had the candlestick, you had the table of showbread, the altar of incense, then you had the veil. And then beyond the veil, 
which was just a third, was the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the high priest would go into only once a year. So mm -hmm. we're talking about that door going into the holy place. And that's where all the priests are doing their thing. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the specific priests. You know, we have, we have priests on the outside that are working the brazen altar, that are working the labor, that are, are, you know, taking care of the animals over here, taking care of the ashes from the brazen altar. And then we have the priests that are inside uh, doing what we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay. All right, so the door. Let's talk about this, the construction of it. The door leading into the holy place consisted of a hanging of blue, purple, and scarlet. We see these colors a lot. If you remember, the gate on the outside had these colors on it. Now we're going into the door into the holy place. It has these colors on it. And then we had the veil, which had these colors, as well as cherubims on it, right? Okay? And then you had the curtain above the, that was the ceiling that had the angels and all those colors on it, too. So are you seeing a pattern here? Every entrance way has a color of the blue, the scarlet, and... Uh, the, the, the purple. It was supported by five pillars of shittim or acacia wood. They, 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 yeah, that was the main wood the that they used in everything. Okay, okay. Overlaid with gold and set in sockets of brass. I'm going to ask you again, what does brass stand for? Judgment. 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 So you have divinity that is being held up by that judgment. Now Jesus took the judgment for us. Okay. It was only 10 cubits wide, half the width of the gate of the court. Again, it's talking about the main gate that we were talking about where they would come in again to the inner court. Mm -hmm. So it was only half the width of that gate. So it's even narrower. Okay, so now we're, we talked about the larger crowd. Yeah. Now we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which, what verse does that remind you of? That's it. Narrow is the way, and few find it. Wide is the gate that leads to death, right? So we're, we're, we're seeing that as an example in the actual tabernacle itself, even way back when. The gate of the court was wide. The door of the sanctuary was narrow. The gate was for all. The door was only for the priests. Now, we who are believers are called priests to the Lord, right? So we have that entrance. We have the right to go into the holy place. We have that right to go in. The typology here is the gospel of the grace of God, which is the court, is for the world. And the gate is wide enough for all to enter. But the privileges and blessings in Christ are only for the believers and the door is therefore narrow. The believer priest has entered the holy place and is walking in the light of the candlestick, deriving his sustenance from the showbread and worshiping at the altar of incense. That is setting us up for the next part. Which is the candlestick. Now we're getting into the furniture. Yes, Susan. Can I, I get a little study on acacia? Yes. It's, uh, it's the wood that is found in the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. It was made of acacia. And it produced a fragrance. Fragrance. Mm -hmm. And it also produced a white pretty charcoal. It was pure. So it was impenetrable. It was called pretty Yes. And, you know, I'm able to now disintegrate God's door. Yeah. Hey, Amen. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. She knows how to take the nuggets. See? <laughs> That's what I like. Get the treasures. Get the, get the nuggets. I'm going to for this, this pleasure. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It, it, and, and everything in the tabernacle, everything was made out of that shittim wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. 
Amen. And like, and like she said, the white stands for righteousness, which we learned that when we talked about that curtain on the outside was white. Fine twined linen, which was white. Righteousness that was hung. Remember, we talked about that. So then that means that that particular wood, if insects couldn't get into it in order to, to break it down, because basically that's how insects do, is break down the wood. You say that means you that whatever was made with that wood and wherever the, the Ark of the Covenant is, mm -hmm. it's still whole. Yeah. The whole thing, the whole the tabernacle, whole every part of it. Because if you go back in all of your notes, when we're talking about any article that was wood, it was the acacia wood or the shittim wood. Everything. All the pillars, all the sockets, the brazen altar. There are some pieces we're going to find out that were hammered out of that metal that were not wood overlaid with gold. Some pieces. Okay. Which we're going to learn about next. The candlestick. Thank you, Susan. That was wonderful. I'm going to grab a drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. I tell the ladies all the time, there is gold, there's nuggets, there's jewels all along, along the way. I might point to one and tell you that there's one hidden there, but you're going to have to dig for it. I'm not going to tell you everything. Hidden where? In God's Word. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, there's always something hidden. Always. <laughs> when I dig, all I get is dirt. <laughs> 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 like, I dig, I dig, I'm like, Shh, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the candlestick. All right. So the candlestick, or literally the lampstand, stood on the south side of the holy place and was made of pure gold. This is not wood overlaid with gold. I want you to get this. This is made out of pure gold. It consisted of a shaft, an upright center branch, which is also known as the servant, the, the, um, the servant stem, okay? An upright center branch and six other branches proceeding out of the shaft, three on each side, which you see as the menorah. We have that over there. This one, however, is a Hanukkah menorah. It's different than what this one was, okay? This one just had three branches on each side. That one has four, okay? So that's a Hanukkah one, representing the nine days that the oil lasted, okay? But the original menorah only had the seven total, three on each side and one in the center, which was called the servant, the servant, uh, stick or the servant um, rod stem. stem. Thank you. Can think of the word servant as in servant, as in we are serving one another. Okay, yeah. So as in Jesus. As in Jesus. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. On the top end of each branch was a lamp, seven lamps in all. So what is the purpose of the candlestick? The candlestick provided the light in the holy place, so the lamps were to be kept continually burning. In that light, the priests served and worshiped God. The general typology, now I apologize for some reason, this outline would not allow me to put all the other information on that same page, so you're gonna have to turn it over. And the rest of it's on page 12. The candlestick speaks of, we got a lot of information on here. Number one, it speaks of Christ as the light of the world. John 1 4, 1 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay? So that lampstand was a typology of Christ. It was also a typology of the church as the reflector of that light. Revelation 120, where it talks about, um, let's see, I have it written down here, yes I do. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and we're talking about in Revelation chapter one, verse 20, mm -hmm. where John saw uh, 
Jesus, or you saw one who had stars in his one hand and uh, uh, the uh, lampstands, golden lampstands in the other, mm -hmm. okay? So this is where we're at here in Revelation. It says, as for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the churches. Okay? So the church of Laodicea, the church of, of Ephesus, Ephesus, the church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia all of those, all of the they, they were the lampstand. The okay. They were supposed to be the lampstand, the light. Mm -hmm. Okay? And let me go back here real quick on the, on the uh, John. So it's not just three and three, it's three, three, and one in the middle, seven? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. On the uh, John 1, 4, and 5, I have written on here some notes here. It says, Jesus as the light brings to this dark world true knowledge, moral purity, and the light that shows the very presence of God. Mm. Now, we are supposed to be the light reflectors or the light carriers as the church. We just read that in Revelation. The individual believer as the dispenser of that light. Okay. Which one? The one you, the last one you just mentioned. Matthew five. Matthew five. Yeah, I'm getting ready to, to read it now. No, no, you're good. The first one was John one four, which talked about Jesus being the light. Then we had Revelation one twenty that talks about the churches being the lampstand. And now we're gonna get ready to read Matthew five, fourteen and fifteen, which actually I have it written fourteen through sixteen, yeah. Right. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives it light, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are the light, and it says that the, you don't put, you don't light, you don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but you put it on a stand so it lights the way for everyone in the house. You are the light of the world. Therefore, let your light shine so that everyone around you sees the way to the Father. Okay? So those three things. Jesus is the light. The church is the lampstand. And now we as carriers of that light, need to let that light shine through us because we're not the light. So ultimately, it's Jesus so in us. We are the church. We are the church collectively. Reflecting that light. Reflecting that light. We're the lampstand. Okay. Jesus is the actual light. Please understand this. I mean, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm going right. to this, make this clear. Jesus is the actual light. Without him, we would just be a lampstand that would not shine anything okay. as a church. Without Jesus being the center of everything, a church does not shine. Right. And you can sense it. You can, you can walk into a church where Jesus is not the center, and you can sense mm -hmm. it. You can tell something, something's not right. Okay? Mm -hmm. They're saying all the right things. They're doing all the right things, and yet there's, there seems to be no life in it. Jesus is the life. He's also the light. All right, so now as a church, as we focus and make Jesus the center of everything, then his light now begins to shine in the church. As a church, we're a lampstand, shining like a beacon for everybody. Now each one of us leave from the collective group, and we each have our own light that we're now carrying inside of us. We're supposed to let that shine and not hide it under a basket, not go back into our homes and hide. We're supposed to shine, not so that people can see us, but that people can see the way to the Father. That's why you shine a light. That's why Jesus, that's why his word says that his word is a lamp to our feet and the light to our path. It doesn't say it's the light that's going to light up the whole entire room. It's just enough for us to know what step to take and where to go, right? That's what our lights are supposed to be doing. The light within us that we're supposed to let shine through us is to let others see which path they're supposed to take to get to the Father. And this, by dispenser, you mean that we, we are, 
so we're shining it. We're dispensing it. We're kind of like, like a flashlight. Jesus is the sun, S O N, as well as S U N, and we are the moon that reflects the light. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're just reflecting him, which is, remember, the inside of the holy place was overlaid with gold. Remember, we talked about that. If we were to turn the lights off right now, there's nothing in this room that would reflect any kind of light whatsoever. If I were to light the candles. But if this room were overlaid with gold, and we had a lampstand that was about as tall as me, with seven branches that had light in it, this room would have a glow to it. It would light up. Maybe not as bright as these fluorescent lights, but it would be enough to where we could see. Mm -hmm. We could see one another. We could see where to go. We can see where the doors are. We could see all of that, mm -hmm. right? So that's... In the same way, if, if there was a mirror in front of it, and it would reflect, right? Exactly. And we're supposed to be a mirror of Christ. Yeah. In order to yeah. be able to give us that light. Yeah. How many movies are there that you've seen? Um, I don't know if you guys have seen The Mummy. I apologize if that offends anybody that I've seen it. <laughs> but at one point in the movie, um, uh, in, at one point in that movie, they, have, they, they find these mirrors that are placed throughout this dark room. And they know that if they get the one mirror to reflect the sun or the moon, it shines on that one, which reflects on that one, which reflects on that one, and it goes all the way throughout the room, and it completely lights up the room. It's like a domino effect. It's like a domino effect, and yet because it's reflecting off of each one, it's not only reflecting, but shining that Shekinah light. So we collectively come together as the body of believers, and we shine together, and yet we can still shine individually as long as we're reflecting Christ. Okay? Isn't so that awesome? The brazen altar, if we go back to the brazen altar, when it talks about the reflection of the water, there's a reflection. That was the labor. That was the labor. Oh. The labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of water. Mm -hmm. um, now, we know that water already has a reflection just because of the properties that water is, but that basin was such a polished metal that you could actually even still see through the water and still see a, and that is more like a mirror of that reflection yeah okay let's go to the detailed typology it's material it was made of pure gold we said this this is not wood overlaid with gold this is pure gold gold speaks of divine character and teaches here that the anti-types of the candlestick should possess likeness to God. It was made of beaten gold. The candlestick was shaped by hammering until it conformed to the divine pattern with its ornamentation of flowers, fruit, and blossoms. Let me stop right there because we didn't read the actual uh, instructions in Exodus that actually had almond blossoms. Mm. And it had almonds that were hammered into those shapes. Mm. So it wasn't like it was poured into a mold. It was beaten into those shapes. Was okay. it like engraved? Not engraved, I mean literally hammered. Mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be softened, mm -hmm. and then they would hammer it into the shape that they wanted, hammered, mm -hmm. okay? This speaks of perfection through suffering. Hebrews 2.10 says this, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So if Jesus had to go through suffering, what makes us think that we're not going to? Beaten gold as well as beaten our Jesus body. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Wow. He was made the perfect sacrifice through that suffering. The lamps themselves, they were filled with pure olive oil. 
typifying the fullness of the Holy Spirit as the source of the believer's light. Again, if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, we're not shining anything. Because we, we can't shine within ourselves. We're, we're not that good. <laughs> so it's the pure, the pureness. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit in each one of us that is the source of the light within us. Well, praise God. Because if not, then we'd be, we'd be going through the same thing Lucifer did. Lucifer was shining. Lucifer had a bright light. Lucifer did all of that. And all of a sudden, he found himself too sweet, too too fine, think, too bright, think, think, he thought, Thinking he's, he's all that in a bag of chips, yeah. <laughs> right? Now check this out. I love this. These lamps had to be refilled daily. Mm -hmm. As the oil was consumed, it needed replenishing. This speaks of the necessity of the believer's renewing of the Holy Spirit. On a daily basis, we're supposed to be renewed by the Holy Spirit. Refreshed and refilled every day by the Holy Spirit. They had to be trimmed periodically. Trimmed? Trimmed, because there was a wick. When, when, when and the wick was made out of the priest's robes. When the priest's robes got too dirty, they wouldn't get clean, they'd rip them into, into rags, and they would use that as the wick. So they had to be trimmed. Just like candles, still really, we should be trimming candles. Get it, it, the, the ash and all the black soot and all of that. All right. Without this, the light would become dim and cause more smoke than light. In like manner, the believer needs occasional trimming by God to remove the things which dim his light. I know. It's the pruning. It's the pruning. It's the, pruning. It's the shaving. It's the <laughs> hammering into... <laughs> into what God wants wants us to be. Dim, dying, right? Yes. They had to burn continually. There should be no periods during which our light fails to shine. Our light should never stop shining. We should continually be able to reflect God's light mm, so and shine. Um, Keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day where you'd be refilled by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. Jose. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> yes. Now the light. The light of the lamp was not their own. We talked about this. It's not our own lamp. The lamp stand itself was not the light. The lamps only contained the light. So we are merely vessels of the Holy Spirit who is the true source of light, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 7, which says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that, that the surprising power belongs to God and not to us. Isn't that amazing? We're just the carriers of it. We can't claim it as our own. The light was consecrated light. This light was only used for the service of God. So we are to use the light of the gospel only for the purpose and the glory of God and not for selfish ends. Amen. The idea that the light was Concentrated light. That's that's what we're talking about. The strange pyre of people, you know, that are not um not on the candlestick. That's when we go to the altar of incense. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah. What are, what are selfish ends? Can you give an example of something that would be selfish motivations? You're doing something that seems to be good on the outside for others, but really you have a selfish motivation. You know, I, I can I can either be helping someone out simply because I want to help them out or I'm helping them out so that I can tell you how good I am and saying, oh, well, I, you know, oh, I just took food to them. They were in need. And so I wanted to help them out. You know, what's the motivation? Was it really because there was a sister or a brother in need and you wanted to help them or is it because it made you look good? Right. Those are selfish ends. Sensational heart and, and it feels so good that we want to continue to because it, it makes us feel good. Is that selfish? No. That's not selfish. 
Okay. No. No, because your motivation is to really help them out. The, the, the thing that's really great about how God works is that as we're doing good, we get the residual blessing of feeling good about it because we're doing something for him. It's the residual blessings. That's how God works. It's not that just the person that you're ministering to gets blessed, but you get blessed yourself. You know, when, when, when Pastor and I are teaching or when we're preaching, um, you know, Pastor says this all the time, that he doesn't remember what he's saying because the Holy Spirit is speaking in him and through him. But I can tell you after the fact, there's... The, <laughs> There's some people that call it uh, like you're, you're on a high or you've got a spiritual buzz <laughs> because you've just been used by God and it's unbelievable the feeling of euphoria that you get. And it's because the creator of all things used his creation to minister to his other creation. And there is something beautiful that happens. There is just, it's that whole sowing and reaping thing that we've been talking about as well. You're sowing good into someone else. You're reaping something from that as well. That's not selfish. That's not selfish. It's when the only reason why you're doing it is because. Sorry, I saw a brown recluse spider over there, and I had to kill it. <laughs> well, I, it's a splat now, <laughs> so I don't know how much you're gonna see. <laughs> Whew. Now I have a hot flash going. <laughs> I had to get it because I'm like, I can't, I can't let that go. <laughs> All right, ladies. I've never heard of them. The really Yes, it is. <clears throat> my sister and my niece both got bit, and it was pretty bad. Um, coming back to the, the selfish motivations, um, <laughs> that was not selfish. That was no, for y'all. No, no. <laughs> well, I saw something moving out of the corner. Of my head. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> it was la, 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 la. making me itch. Okay. Um, anyway, um, you know when it's selfish because you have that gnawing feeling that. You know, the only reason why you're doing it is that I look good, that I have a story to tell, that I have a testimony to share, when really it's because you just want to get up and you want to have people look at you as though, wow, what a martyr or what a sacrificial person you are. Or, you know, we maybe you've heard this saying, you know, uh, people put themselves on the fire you know, put themselves on the altar to, to help someone else out? Or did you really sacrifice because it was the love of your brother or sister to do that? Or was it because you wanted the, you wanted the attention? You wanted the glory. That's it. You wanted the glory. That's what it means by the selfish intentions. and, and, and the, that's, kind of, that's kind of um, what the uh, Sadducees, a lot of the Sadducees were doing uh, when they were talking about that they pray. He said, when you fast, do not do as, you the, know. The Pharisees they, and the Sadducees Pharisees, do, yeah. Yeah, that they go and they make, you know, they look all bad. You can tell <laughs> that they've been fasting. They look like they were going through. Who knows you know? if they've even been fasting? Huh? <laughs> what was that? Who knows, Who knows, if, knows if they, they even, actually were fasting? Yeah, but the whole yeah. idea is that they wanted to get the glory from other people saying, oh, look at him. He's fasting for the Lord. They're getting the glory. Exactly. And, he, and that's what the word says. You know, he got his reward. He got his reward. That's the reward. The reward is that God, that the people were saying, oh, look at him. But God doesn't give a reward because he knows the motive. Exactly. It's like you're tooting your own horn. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and that kind of even comes from the Pharisees, too, because they actually had somebody that blowed the trumpet when they were walking in, saying, you know, there's, there's a great man getting ready to walk in here. You know, and they would have long prayers, you know, to, just to hear themselves talk. Those are selfish. It's like when you give, don't let others see that you're giving. You know, that's the genuine, you know, you don't let others see. That yeah. Really others see, others even know, you know, uh, any of it. No one, God sees. And, and, and as the, the verse that you're talking about there, Liz, 
about what, you know, don't be like the Sadducees and the Pharisees who do all those things that make their face look gaunt while they're fasting so others know that they are. But instead, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing is what that, what that verse is talking about. And it says, if you do these things in secret, God will reward you publicly. But if you're seeking the glory, like Liz said, God's not going to give you any glory because you're not giving it to him. You already got it. You already got it. it. Yeah. Oh, no, don't feel guilty for doing, yeah, don't let that guilt come in. No, 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 don't let that. It's 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 perfectly fine. It's the residual fine. blessing. It is the residual think, blessing. Think of the, 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 the euphoria of the residual blessing. Yeah, and then, and then just give God that joy, that feeling, and saying, Lord, wow, you, you gave me this opportunity to bless somebody or to help somebody. Thank you. Thank you that I had the ability to do it. Thank you, God, that you made a way for uh, to use my hands in this way, mm-hmm. you know. And let that be between you and the Lord. It doesn't need to be publicly and, and, and open because then it kind of does that whole switcheroo let thing. Let someone else be the one to boast about you. Yeah. That's true. Fasting should be um, blared out either. You should mm-hmm. fast privately. That's right. true. Right, right, right. Unless the pastor is calling for a corporate fast, then we all know we're fasting, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's, right, right, <laughs> yeah. And, and there's times where having a corporate fast is needed. The Lord is, is calling the church body into, into a fast for, for something. You know, that's very biblical. Um, but if you're individually deciding to go on a fast, no, nobody needs to know any of it. No one needs to even... You know, and it's, it actually even says, do just the opposite. Wash yourself Wash up, yourself. make yourself look, look good. Makeup. Put your oh, makeup yeah. on, do your hair, get your clothes. Get your look. Bling, bling on. Yeah, yeah, make yourself look good and and so drink, no one drink knows. Water. If they invite you for lunch, drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other questions? I, I find that a little difficult. You know, sometimes that I find myself that, you know, I am, let's say, fasting onto the Lord. And then all of a sudden, spontaneously, hey, let's let's go to lunch. Let's let's go here, and I'll I'll you know, because you know what do you do? No, I can't go. Uh, mm-hmm. You know. So well, some gonna... sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can say, I'm sorry, I have another appointment. Yeah. And my appointment is spend time with the Lord, but they don't need to know that, <laughs> right. Right? right? It's like you know, oh man, I really appreciate it. I I but I already have my I already have something on my schedule. Right. You know. I mean, sometimes that's that's the way it is. Yeah. Not always fun, though, is it? <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions about the candlestick before we move on to the next piece of furniture? All right. The table of showbread. And just so you know, remember, we're coming in from the east. And it said that the candlestick was at the south. So it's going to be on the left. When you walk in the candle, the, the lamp stands on your left. Okay. Now we're going to the right, and we're going to see a table of showbread. And that's the north. And that's the north. Because we're coming from the east. I remember the gate and the door face the east. Yes. So you're coming in the direction. As you're walking in, you're going west. Yes. Okay. The south is going to be on your left, and north is going to be on your right. And that's the only time I actually know directions. If we're in a car, if we're going up a hill, it's north. If we're going down a hill, it's south. <laughs> Not necessarily, but okay. That's the way it is in my mind. I'm yeah. going up a hill. I'm going north. If I'm going down the hill, I'm now going south. And don't turn me around the minute it switches. Exactly. That's all I'm saying. I have no directions. Don't give me north, south, east, west when you're giving me driving directions, please. <laughs> Okay. Thank God for GPS. Whew. Yes. And that it keeps getting better and better. <laughs> All right. The table of showbread design. The table of showbread, literally the bread of presence, was made of that shittim or acacia wood. And it should be the W O O D, not the one that's on there. Sorry about that. <laughs> the wood overlaid with gold and a golden crown around the top. I didn't catch what you said. 
Now, if you read the sentence, the wood is the incorrect wood. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. All right, so it was made of wood overlaid with gold and a golden crown around the top. Rings were placed on the four legs through which staves were passed to carry it. Now, we kind of talked about this along with the wall of the inside of the tabernacle. If you remember, we taught, said that there were rings on the wall so that that rod could go slide through they, it, so that way it could um, keep it all together as one piece and it would secure it. We also talked about the brazen altar that had those staves on it as well that they, it could be carried on people's shoulders. Okay, this is the same way. So on each leg there was basically a ring where that stave or that rod could go through so it could be carried. Okay, that's what all that means. The purpose, 12 loaves sprinkled with frankincense lay upon the table in two rows. And I wish I had uh, access to this, the uh, screen here because I had a picture of all of this so you, you could see it. There's two different ways of thinking about these loaves of bread being in two rows. Some believe that it was two stacks of six pieces of bread each. And there's the thought that it was actually two literal rows and six being there. Doesn't state which way it was stacked and it doesn't really necessarily matter. It's just the fact that it was there and it was representing, we're getting ready to read what it was representing. At the end of the week, they were replaced and the priest received them as their food. Okay, so at the beginning of the week, the loaves would pla were placed on the, the table of, of showbread or the, um, the uh, bread of the presents. They stayed there all week. At the end of the week, when new, new fresh ones were being made, the priest would then take those home, and that's what they would eat. Okay? The typology. So what is this an example of? Number one, of Christ. The table of showbread speaks primarily of Christ as the bread of life, as it says in John 6.35, which says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The number 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel in communion and fellowship with God. This suggests that all of God's covenant people are invited to partake of God's provision for their sustenance. There's not one of us who call ourselves a child of God who doesn't have access to the provision that we have need of. Not a one of us. Mm -hmm. It's also an example of the Lord's Supper. We talked about the Old Testament is constantly pointing towards Jesus, constantly pointing towards the redemptive plan that God had from the beginning. And here we have in the Old Testament already showing about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper here. The table of showbread also foreshadows the communion table of the people of the New Covenant where Christians partake of bread and wine, emblems of the broken body and shed blood of Christ, according to Matthew 26, 26 through 29, which reads, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you, in my father's kingdom Amen. hallelujah and then finally the heavenly feast the table of showbread is also typical of the great feast which will be held in heaven the marriage supper of the lamb revelation 19 9 which says and the angel said to me write this blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true words of god Any questions about 
the table of showbread or the bread of the presence. It represents that Jesus is the bread of life. He's our sustenance. And we as priests are to consume that. You know, what did he say? What did he say to the woman at the well? You'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. If you drink of this water, this living water, you'll never thirst again. It's the same thing with the I am statements that are in the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the shepherd. <laughs> All of the I am statements of Jesus. We see so many of them depicted here in the tabernacle itself. All right, any questions before we move on? We're going through these pretty good. Okay. The altar of incense. One of my favorites. Description. The altar of incense was made again of shittim or acacia wood. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Overlaid with gold. And four square. What does that mean? It's a perfect square. That's all that that means. It's not a rectangle. It's not long on two ends and short on the other. It's completely square. It had horns like the brazen altar projecting from its four corners and a crown of gold around it for beauty. This, the, the table of showbread also had that, that crown it talks about. You know what that actually means? If, if you've ever seen um, just a really pretty decorative table that uh, it's not just flat, but it has like an edging on the top of it, around it, like ornate, that's what it's talking about, a crown. So it's not just a flat table. It, it had that lip that kind of came up and it was decorative that they call a crown. Yeah, you, if you want to show that around. Um, the table of showbread has that and so does the altar of incense right there. Uh, if you want to show them that picture so they can see what the crown was. Yeah, two seconds. Oh, I see. The table of showbread, so you can kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So just like the brazen altar, this altar of incense had those four horns as well. Now remember, the brazen altar, those four horns were for tying the animal down. Okay. So let's talk about what what it might be for here. It says the blood of the sin offering of atonement was put upon the horns of the altar once a year. Two staves were used for transport and were passed through rings at the four corners. Once again, is that one for? Yep, to, in order for them to carry it, to, to move it from place to place. And once a year, the blood, remember there, there was a process that the high priest had to go through in order to sanctify himself or get himself ready to go into the Holy of Holies. And one of it was to kill a goat and take the blood and it would sprinkle it on these horns. So only once a year was that done. Okay. It stood closest to the presence of God just before the veil. On this altar was placed a golden censer containing burning coals from the altar of sacrifice. The fire in the censer called out the fragrance of the incense, which was to be offered every morning when the lamps were dressed and every evening when the lamps were lit. I don't understand that. Now it's talking the about... were blessed? Hmm? When they were trimmed, when they were... When fresh oil was put in the... So it's talking about two different things here. It's talking about that... that, that and you see a lot of the, the Catholic priests carry that censer of the incense. Oh. Only this was a censer that was put at the altar on top of the coal. So they would add the incense in there every day, just like they would trim and dress the lampstand. The wicks, they would trim the wicks, they would put fresh oil in there. So at the same time that was happening, there was another priest that was taking care of the incense bowl, making sure that there was fresh incense in that censer that was put on the coals at the altar. So that's what that's called, that the censer... A censer. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know, and they only they only did that at least in the Catholic Church on select um, type of holy days. A select, select type of holy yeah. days. Hmm. Not uh, also no, uh, and and like during Holy Week, Holy, Holy Week, Week being that between um, after Palm Sunday, but bef uh, but and but and Good Friday. I mean, all throughout that, and they would do the Stations of the Cross on select times of the year mm -hmm. as well. That so okay. yeah. Oh, um, like, I said, oh, they won't be there because the stinky stuff. <laughs> the stinky but stuff. Even, even It's a special type of blessing. It's a blessing. It's like a special type of blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because remember, we pray for them to stay in purgatory, uh, to be because we're considered all sinners. We don't. We don't go to the presence of God. We don't go to the presence of God. We just stay in purgatory. Mm -hmm. We stay in purgatory. I, that that part, you know, I that never. I never understood that. Never understood because it's a I'm thankful I never had to. So <laughs> I never had to understand that part of it. So I'm thankful. Thank you, Lord. Okay. All right. Now, if you turn to page 14, we have a lot, even a lot more reading. And this is going to really break some things down about the altar of incense. So what was it before we turned over that you said about what it says in the morning when the lambs were dressed? What does that mean again? They were trimmed when the wicks were trimmed in oh, the no. oil. <clears throat> Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. Okay. So let's talk about the general typology of this altar of incense. The, it is a foreshadowing of Christ as our intercessor. Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So it points to Jesus as our intercessor. Believers, it's a foreshadowing of us, the prayer and praise offered to God in worship, which we read about in Revelation. Remember the bowls of incense. They are our prayers to the Lord. This was a physical representation of that. Okay? So it, it's an example of Jesus as he's our intercessor. He's our inter, uh, intermediary. As well as our prayers and our worship to the Lord is a, as a fragrance to the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're getting ready to talk about in a little bit once we get through all the the detailed typology here, we actually are going to go over the composition, what all was actually in it and what all those things meant. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's get into a detailed typology. The general ones was that it was an example of Christ, an example of us as believers. Now let's get detailed. The altar itself. The fact that this table is called an altar teaches us that there is an element of sacrifice in our prayer and in our worship. Why don't we know that? How many times when we don't feel like giving God worship because we're not in a, we're going through it. We're going through a storm. What we're going through is not pleasant. It's a sacrifice of praise. This is what this part is talking about. We have, we had at the, in the beginning when we came into the gates, as, as the psalm says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That's the praise part. That's the happy, happy, joy, joy. We're making a loud noise. Hallelujahs. That's where we're shouting and all this glory is going on. Now we're in a closed environment. Now the rubber is meeting the road, and now is where we have our intimate worship with the Lord. It isn't the praise part, it's the worship part. 
Don't get those two confused. They're two different things. And our prayers are not just, Lord, bless me, be with me throughout this day. It's not that kind of prayer. It's the one where, like Jesus, where you were sweat, you're sweating blood. You're really interceding, whether it's for yourself, a situation, or for someone else. I mean, you are really just digging in and praying like, Lord, I don't understand. I need your help here. And it's a sacrifice. Because sometimes it can be so painful, you don't even have words to say in that prayer. Sometimes all you can do is just wail in his presence. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Yes. And that's where a lot of times you're going to be praying in the spirit because you just groans, yes. Your petitions and your groanings before the Lord happens at this altar. That's what is happening at this altar. Okay. The fire, the fire taken from the brazen altar of sacrifice shows that prayer and praise must be kindled by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. How can we be true worshipers in spirit and in truth if we're not recognizing that the, the ability that we even have to go into his presence is because of the sacrifice that Jesus made? So they actually would take the coals from the brazen altar and put the coals at the altar to burn the incense on. It wasn't just lit with a match right then and there. They took the coals from the sacrifice place and took those hot embers, those hot coals, and put it in the altar and put that incense bowl or that censer right on top of it so it would burn and the fragrance would fill the room. So in order for that fragrance to fill the room, we have to recognize the sacrifice because that's where the fire is coming from, from the sacrifice. So well, is that the same as being kindled? Yes. Okay. That's where the, ki the, the... The kindling comes into play. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's the, the warm coals from the brazen altar. Remember the brazen altar was pretty high. And remember it was it was remember we said it was about five feet, so it was about my height, the brazen altar. Okay. I'm I'm just it'll it would come to about right here. <laughs> Cause I'm five two. <laughs> okay. So there was not only the ash underneath, but how else would that animal burn unless there was wood or coal, you know, really wood, not coal. They call it coals on the altar because there, there's, there's, you know, when you have a bonfire and you have a fireplace and you've got wood burning, you've got those embers that are, are red, red hot. They would use those, take it to the altar. Mm -hmm. And that's what they would use to light the incense. Mm -hmm. Is that making more sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The effects of the fire. We were just talking about it. The fragrance of the incense is only released by the heat of the fire and suggests that the necessity of the fire of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to stimulate our devotions. Mm -hmm. Because it's not within us as human beings, it's not within our flesh to get this intimate with anybody or anything. Mm. But the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of what Jesus did for us should burn such a devotion within us that it causes this prayer and this worship, this intimacy with the Lord. If we don't have that fire, there's nothing that lights it up. There's nothing that sparks it, nothing that gets it going because we can't do it within ourselves. We don't and have it. What we do within ourselves just by ourselves has no power. That exactly. reminds me, I don't know what a pastor that was saying, that uh, um, uh, somebody came um, from China, was it uh, during the service, or somebody came from China and uh, to the United States, and, the, and people from some churches were taking them around, showing them all the ministries and showing them everything that they were doing in the churches. And then he asked, so what do you think, you know, about, you know, what do you think about ministries? What do you think about a church? What do you think? And he says, Wow, it's great, all the stuff that he's done without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. No, they, 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 were they were just doing. They were just doing. They were just doing. 
Yeah. So the effect of the fire is that it releases an incense. Sometimes when you're cooking, some recipes will tell you to actually put the spices in the frying pan before you do anything else, and you put the spices in there to warm it up because it warms up. It gets, it gets the fragrance coming out of those herbs and those spices, and then you can add the food to it, but it, it doesn't release the potency until you get it in that heat, until you get it on. This is what this is doing. This is what the effects of the fire does. Once it hits, it releases. You can't help but worship. How many of you can say, whether it was a worship service that you ever attended at church or whether it was your own time with the Lord, where just out of the blue, the, you were just in song and just all of a sudden, boom, it hit you and it was just like, ah, oh, my goodness. Something, I mean, it just overwhelmed you. And, and you know, sometimes all, when, I, when that happens to me, sometimes all I can do is just pray in the spirit. Sometimes, it, I mean, it's just sobbing. like sobbing. It just, oh my gosh. Well, that's what just happened. Holy Spirit just lit that fire and released a worship within me that I didn't even know was even in there. Amen. Amen. Okay. Here we go, Susan. The acacia wood. Since wood speaks of humanity, the shittim acacia wood here typifies the human side of prayer and worship. There is, we, we, we are part of that worship. We have to give that worship. Now we have the gold. It's overlaid in gold. Since the gold speaks of deity, its use here typifies the divine side of prayer and worship. So we use our human words to start the prayers, and sometimes the spirit has to take over. That deity within us takes over because we have no more words to say. There are no words, not only in the English language, but no earthly language that can really express whether it is just a hurt in our heart or whether it is a joy, whether it is a just a worship to the Lord. You know, that's why I think some people, uh, there's different expressions of worship. It isn't just all singing. And I was just explaining to a young man this past Friday for after, after the worship service, and I was explaining to the young man, you know, uh, I understand all this prophetic worship. I do. I get it, and it's beautiful. But sometimes we've lost the art of just letting the music play and not vocalizing things because there is a difference between someone who plays an instrument and someone who is a musician. There is a difference. Someone who's a musician knows how to worship on his instrument and not just play it. Mm -hmm. Which is why David could play his harp for Saul and it would calm his demons. I don't know if David ever sang for Saul. I'm sure he did. But a lot of times in scripture it says that he played for Saul. You know, and there's, there's a couple individuals that I have personally met, actually more than just a couple, there's, there's about four of them that I can think of off the top of my head, that worship on their instrument. And I'm telling you, when you have someone who knows how to worship on their instrument, you can hear praise coming out of it. it I don't know how to explain it. It's not that I hear words, but yet I know it's worship. I feel it and I connect with it. Someone who just spontaneously begins to start dancing, it's because there's nothing in them that can further explain or express how they're feeling and they've got to move and show and dance before the Lord. David danced before the Lord because he was so excited that the Ark of the Covenant was back. It wasn't just that he was just happy, happy, joy, joy. He didn't know how else to express his gladness and his joy that the presence of the Lord was back. So he began dancing. Liz does flags in worship, and man, I love it. It's so beautiful. It's the ex expression of her worship, and she sings along with it, which is just double beauty for me and my ears and my, and my eyes to behold that. Anybody worshiping, however, that's why we welcome you to worship however the Lord is moving on you to, to worship. It's not just vocalizing. It's not just the lifting of the hands, which all of those are part of it, and it's beautiful. 
But there comes a point in time where that's just not enough. But yet there's still so much in you that you need to express. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 the the part yeah, and it, it is a fragrance. I mean it really our praise and our prayers, our worship to the Lord, it is a fragrance in his nostrils. The word says that. It is a fragrance. Um but we're talking about the wood being our humanity and the gold being the deity. So I'm talking about how we can, we can gather together and we can begin worshiping the Lord. We can sing a song and it's a beautiful song and we'll just worship. We can lift up our hands. This is our human side being a part, being, uh, uh, expressing our part, our human part of worship. But there comes a point in time where it goes beyond that and that's where the spirit takes over. That's where the, the deity comes in. Not only that, but in our humanness, then God also comes out in his deity and covers us and comes in our presence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he comes with a hush. Sometimes he comes with a shout where we just all begin shouting. That sometimes there comes with joy and gladness. And sometimes you have even caught me with, I'm, I'm literally crying. I'm, I'm, I'm having to get tissues to wipe my, mm -hmm. my, my eyes. Yeah. And, and it's just, the presence is just so awesome. I, I, I can't, I cannot say can't anything or yeah. sing anymore. I just have to yeah. Be, yeah. let my emotions be, come out. Yeah. You have to be, but, and I understand what you're saying about the, uh, the wood being our humanness. And, and as we're praising the Lord in, in song and corporately, and then all of a sudden, like you said, the Holy Spirit comes down. That's the the encasement of the wood, or the gold, deity, uh, mm -hmm. the gold over the wood. Mm -hmm. This is His deity, His presence, His overlaying over us. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we we get to that point is because our bodies can't take the presence of God. Our bodies, our flesh, cannot take. That's why it said in the Old Testament, "You can't see God. You can't see my face and live." Yeah. You can't see my face and live, but yet we're in the New Testament where we saw, many saw his face and lived mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it was in the face of Jesus. Yes. And he's the one that died for us. Yes. And because we represent him, we're, we are able, you know, to be overlaid with Jesus. Well, we have his blood on you know, us. We're we covered have, in his blood. And blood. so therefore we have deity Praise covering blood. us. You know, Absolutely. So, and, and each and every person, depending on their personalities, receive it differently. Yeah. You see, you receive it at the point where you can, you know, you have to be still and it comes out in tears. You know? Or in laughter, either or. Or yeah. in laughter. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That goes to show and then we have a few sisters. And we have a few sisters that, that they, they just start, you know, different spiritual language. Exactly. Like Carol and I've even heard uh, Barbara. In, in a mm -hmm. spiritual language. In a completely different spiritual language. And yeah. for me, it comes in dance sometimes. And so, you know, where I, I, I have to get up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got to I got to I got to get up, I got to get up, you know? So everybody is um, That's what makes us affected me. differently. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's affected differently. Yeah. And, um, and I had a, a young man that I knew years ago in Tennessee who... At the time, he played drums. Now he plays the guitar. He's also a pastor out in, in California. Um, and I remember him saying uh, the times where he would be leading worship, and he's like, did you ever just get so just overwhelmed with God that you just want to scream or, like, kick something over because you just don't know how else to express you know what you're feeling. That's where the Shabbat comes from, right? That's that's Shabbat, where a, a, a sudden burst. Yes. You know, a, a just shout, a certain shout, which I believe that was what brought down the Jericho wall. Absolutely. Was the shout. Was the shout. Absolutely. So, uh, the presence of God, because the, the presence is so strong that yes. you have to let you have to let yes. it out somehow. And when it comes out in the shout, I I, I tend shout. to shout a lot. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but it's a pretty shout. You know, it, when 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 I'm in work, when I'm in worship, and I just, oh my gosh! I mean, I, I couldn't be any more surrounded by the Holy Spirit and by mm -hmm. the presence of God, and all I can do is just shout. It's like, ah! 
oh my goodness, this is awesome. So it comes in many different ways, but that is where, that is where earth meets heaven. That's that moment. What's Shabbat? Shabbat is a Hebrew word for shout. Yeah. You know, where, where it's just a sudden burst. Yeah, sudden you know, burst of shout. Yeah. Like, like when you pop a, a wall it, balloon. Shout and bat. Yeah. Teeth. So, all right. We're, we're, we're now on six, the fragrance. Yes, we are. Okay. All yeah. right. The fragrance, the sweet smell of the incense testifies to the pleasure with which God receives our devotions. Mm -hmm. Now we have some verses in here, some some two two different, one from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. I'm going to have you guys read that nugget and contrast the one with the other, okay? Okay. Put an asterisk on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're very, very different ways that God received or did not receive that incense. The position, it's positioned before the veil, nearer to the presence of God than the other pieces of furniture, which testifies to our nearness to God in devotions. All of these things keep bringing us closer into the presence of the Lord, doesn't it? And that devotion, that incense, that altar of incense, that prayer and that worship heart, that intimate devotion gets us closest to that presence gets us closer to the rising of incense this suggests the pouring out of our affections to God and their acceptableness before him mm. we're pouring out our praise we're not just saying words but it literally is coming from our heart it's coming from the deep places within us in our devotion to him in our spirit man is just crying out to the Lord and thankful. Whatever it is, whether it's thankfulness, whether it's gratitude, whether it's joy, whether it's just, God, I just love you. You don't have to do one more thing for me. You've done enough for me. God, you are just amazing. You are awesome. You are a mighty God. All of these are part of your worship. I mean, you know, when you brag on, on your husband, or you brag on your child, or you brag on that closest person in your life they they it makes them want to come nearer to you <laughs> and when you brag on the lord and his goodness and the fact that his goodness has nothing to do with whether you're in a good situation or not because god is still good That's right. regardless he's still awesome regardless he's still mighty regardless He's still amazing, regardless. He's still faithful, regardless. And the fact that he's faithful means that at some point you're going to get the answer. At some point he's going to make the way known to you. At some point he's going to show that. He is faithful. So who are these that are being accepted? It's our praise. It's our devotion to the Lord that's being acceptable to the Lord. Oh, I see. I've never seen acceptableness as a, as a whole word. And so it threw me off. Yeah. And it's there except, okay. Right, the pouring of our affections. Okay. It's, that's the there. That's the subject of the there. Its shape, the four square shape of the altar speaks of the universal, the universal scope of prayer in which the whole world should be included. Mm. North, south, east, and west. The staves, the staves for transport show that devotions are not confined to one specific place only. That's why it's 839. I know. Okay. Thank you. But may and should be offered wherever we are. That's right. That we no longer have to be in, we are the tabernacle, so wherever we are, we can worship in that way. Absolutely. At any point in time. Any point in time, I can be on a bus somewhere. I can be in the middle of some kind of crazy situation. situation. I can close my eyes and I can be right there in the presence of the Lord. Simply by pouring my affection <coughs> for him and to him. Whichever way. 
whichever way. Any expression. Any expression. Any expression. As long as it's coming from your heart and it's towards God, it doesn't matter what the expression is. It doesn't always have to be stillness. Sometimes it is. As, as, as Liz said, sometimes it's a shout. Sometimes it's a dance. But it's pouring our affections on him. So blood. I used to sing on the bus. Can you take me on the bus? I used to sing on the bus. I just be sitting you know, and the, we're in a traffic jam, everybody's getting all upset, you know, <laughs> because everybody's gotta get to work and and I was like, Oh Lord, you know, and extra time. And I would just start to praise God and you know, really calm people down and you know, <laughs> spend my time with the Lord. That's all by myself. That's a gift to Jesus. I said if you if you people if you people wanna come along with me, come along. Yeah. 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 Most of us are self conscious. We're not going to just sing. I know, but what I'm saying is everybody's different. Where you would be still, I would be exactly the opposite. I'd be out there. Singing. And both of them are just as acceptable just to the Lord because it's coming from your heart. It doesn't matter which avenue you take, meaning your worship. We know there's only one way to Jesus, Amen. right? But it doesn't matter what avenue your praise and worship, your worship and your prayer takes, whether you're a quiet person in prayer, whether you're someone who is who cries, who, you know, whatever it is, as long as it's to the Lord and it's with, with your devotion, with all your heart, it's acceptable to the Lord. It is a lovely fragrance to his nostrils. We have one more and we'll close it with this. The blood. The blood upon the horns teaches us that true prayer and praise can only be acceptable on the basis of the atonement of Christ. We know that the only way that we have, the only reason we have access to the Father is because of the shed blood of Jesus. So the blood that's on the altar is a representation of letting us know the only way that we can truly even get to the place as close to the presence of the Lord as we are at this point in the tabernacle is because of the shed blood of Jesus. That's what that is a representation of. Amen. Amen. And there's an old saying, grab the horns of the altar. You know, we used to have prayer meetings where people would stay at the altar until their prayer, either their need was met or the Lord released that intercession that was in them. That was called grabbing the horns of the altar, which is the altar of incense is what it's really referring to. Grab a hold of the horns of the altar and stay there until you've met with the Lord. You know, in the church that I went to, they would stay, they would stay all hours of the night. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Yeah. That was a vigil, yeah. Vigil. Yeah, yeah, vigil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and sometimes it would be just in your own home. But it's, again, it's that prayer time that you are needing an answer and you are not leaving the presence of the Lord until you get that answer. Kind of like how Jacob wrestled with God. And he says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. He was grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar. I mean, he was literally grabbing hold of God. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there. We'll pick up the composition of the incense and the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant on our last we've, session. We've gone through a lot of meat today. We've gone through a lot, and I know it was fast. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of gold nuggets there. Again, there's but a lot of treasure. But it's amazing how it all flowed. I'm like... Oh, yeah. Let's close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we just are so thankful that we've had this opportunity to, to hear your word and to have it just open up to us and explained, Father in such a beautiful way to see how all of your word from Genesis all the way through Revelation, it's the same. It's the same message. It's that you love us, that you wanted relationship with us, that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to die for us in our place. Father, we are so thankful for the sacrifice. Jesus, we're so thankful that you were obedient even unto death. And because of that obedience, we can now come before Abba, Father, and pour out our praise on him, pour our adoration on him for all that he's done for us. Father, I pray that the things that we've learned tonight, we take home with us tonight, that we hear you singing over us. 
that we would even see you dancing over us with joy and how much pleasure you take in our worship and adoration to you. Father, be with us. Protect us as we travel home tonight, Lord. Mm. Be with us throughout the night and in the morning, Lord. We thank you that your mercies are going to be new. Mm -hmm. Lord, I thank you that today will be in the past. Tomorrow is a new, fresh day, Lord. Holy Spirit, fill us afresh and anew as we learn tonight. As we feast on the manna of Jesus on a daily basis. Father, we give you all praise and glory for this. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.